Welcome to the easier way to sell presentation of Close the Deal Without Selling. Here's your host and developer of the easier way to sell, Ike Krieger. Hey, this is Ike Krieger. Welcome back. Welcome to the Easier Way to Sell presentation of Close the Deal Without Selling. I'm the founder and developer of the Easier Way to Sell. My name is Ike Krieger. For those of you listening for the first time, I want to let you know this is called the Easier Way to Sell because it gets rid of all the things that make you crazy when you use the traditional way to sell. There's no more presentation. There's no more closing. There are no more objections. Objections literally disappear. What you hear in some of these podcasts is not so much about the system, but the type of person you actually need to commit to being in order for this system to work as efficiently as it was designed to do. So enjoy this episode. There's a lot of good information on it, and I'm looking forward to you becoming a regular listener, if you're not already, of the Close the Deal Without Selling podcast. Here we go. In our last episode, I responded to a listener who was having issues with dropping his traditional selling protocol in favor of the easier way to sell. Now, in the easier way to sell conversation, you conduct a thorough diagnostic examination. And during this examination, your prospect comes to the conclusion on their own that what you offer will help them move from where they are to where they want to be, which, by the way, is our definition of a problem. A problem exists when there's a difference between your present state and your desired state. With that in mind, I must confess that I may have oversimplified the process for going into a prospect meeting. And here are the steps I suggested. One, you declare yourself to be a diagnostic problem solver. Two, you're clear on your outcome. Three, you walk into the call with nothing. Four, you stop giving your presentation. Five, you stop performing your time-tested demo. Six, you're thinking like a doctor. Seven, you open with the yes formula prelude. Eight, you're brilliant at asking open-ended questions. Have you tried these steps? If not, why not? For the easier way to sell, you must make a shift in your communication style. Some find this adjustment of communication style easier to adapt to than others, and some become accustomed to the easier way to sell more readily than others. Now, your goal with the easier way to sell is to be a receiver of information rather than a giver, and you may find this difficult. You're used to being on the talking end of a sales conversation rather than the listening end. The question then becomes, how comfortable are you transitioning from a presentation-based communication to an interview-based communication? Effective interviews rely on open-ended questions, and my experience has proven that your uncomfortability with using this system is a product of preparation or lack thereof. To move away from closed-ended questions, you have to learn effective open-ended interview questions, and these questions must become second nature to you. These questions must become who you are as a communicator. When you attempt to use this system without learning all the necessary diagnostic open-ended questions, the system will remain uncomfortable. I can guarantee that. I guarantee that the system will remain uncomfortable if you're still not up to speed with your open-ended question assignments. You've been asked to memorize all of the open-ended questions that I've shared, and there are pages and pages of these types of questions in the podcast action guide. You are instructed to write down your open-ended questions on a sheet of paper, then say them into your recorder while remaining in the mode of a curious, authentic, and neutral doctor. Keep going back to who you are as a doctor of salesology. What your sales conversation is not about is you being the best presenter. It's not about you having the snappiest or flashiest demo among all your peers. It's not about anything like that at all. 
It's about being a great questioner and an even better listener. And one way to become a great questioner is to memorize your open-ended questions and use them. In your action guide, there's a page called PSDS questions. Find that page. Look at the questions. For those of you not following along in the guide, here they are. What do you want? What's stopping you from getting it? How do you think I can help? What would happen if you do nothing? What would happen if you keep doing what you're doing? What seems to be the real problem here? How serious is the situation? What can I do to make a difference? What would you do differently if you could go back to when you started this project? What's one thing that you really don't like about the way things are going? What's one thing you would change immediately? When did you first realize that you needed to do things differently? How long have you been considering doing something about this? What's all this costing you? How important is it for you to find a better way to handle this? What has this situation caused you to sacrifice? What are you doing to resolve this? What would you like me to do next? What's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? What system are you using to X? How is it working? What led to your current situation? All right. Now, if you're reading from the guide, I'd like you to close your eyes. And if you're driving a vehicle, here's some coaching. Keep your eyes open. Now, point to any question on the page. Open your eyes and read the question out loud. You've just, more than likely, asked a good and effective diagnostic open-ended question. So, spend your time memorizing these and all of the open question alternatives I've shared on the podcast. And again, there are pages and pages of these questions in the action guide. Learn these questions. Digest them. Become them. Let them become who you are as a communicator. The next time you walk into an appointment and you go, Oh goodness, I wish I had my presentation or I wish I had my demonstration kit to rely on. Remember the value and the power of these questions. These questions will help you uncover the difference between your prospect's present state and their desired state and cause them to internalize that difference. When your prospect internalizes to think about your product or service, they're trying to imagine themselves in the future with their problems solved and their needs being met. They're fantasizing about the possible outcome of using your offering. Using your newly developed sensory awareness skills, you'll recognize when your prospect is moving from their present state to a graphic mental representation of their problem being solved and their needs being met. When you see this fantasy take over, you can relax and move forward with your conversation. If the fantasy does not take over, you're probably wasting your time. Shake hands and move on. Speaking of internalizing, what happens after you internalize all these open-ended questions? You'll become comfortable enough with open-ended questions that you'll be able to interview your prospect and you'll see if they qualify for your offering. You'll see if they qualify as a recipient for your presentation and you'll see if they're worthy of a great demonstration. But begin by memorizing those darn questions. Can you learn this system? Can you ditch your pitch? Can you ask open-ended questions and listen? Of course you can. And what will you need to make this a reality at your next appointment? You'll need nothing but a pencil and a piece of paper and a mind filled with your newly memorized open-ended diagnostic questions. When it comes to open-ended diagnostic questions, remember, ask and ye shall receive. For those of you really serious about learning the easier way to sell, I've got some good news, and that's the Close the Deal Without Selling podcast action guide is available. This optional guide will help you with all of the questions, all of the exercises, and if you would like to actually teach people the easier way to sell, it will serve as your teaching guide. So enjoy.
You're listening to a podcast about selling and communication, so of course, let's jump right into a conversation about tennis. Now, there's no way I can play tennis anymore, not with my old man knees, and that's the bad news. The good news is that since I was never really good at tennis, I have no desire to play. But I have, however, known a few really good tennis players over the years, and I've learned a lot about the game. I was especially intrigued when our discussions would turn to the creation of a winning strategy for a tennis match. Now, of course, there are strategies in tennis, just like there are in chess. And the number one strategic idea that kept popping up about tennis was keep the ball in the other person's court. The first time I heard this, my response was immediate and appropriate. I asked, why is that? Here was the reply. The hardest thing to do in tennis is to hit the ball over the net successfully. And if you play tennis, you know that's true. And even if you don't play tennis, you still know that's true. This winning strategy is simple. You keep the ball in the other person's court. You have your opponent be the one who must do the work of returning the ball to your side. Have your opponent be the one who must hit the ball over the net successfully. Sure, I was aware of the apparent inconsistencies in the strategy, but soon I realized that the only thing that mattered was the concept of keeping the ball in the other person's court. So how do you do that in communication? How do you keep the ball in the other person's court when having a conversation? Well, you keep the ball in the other person's court by drum roll, please, by asking an open-ended question. Since your job is to get information and not give it, you must ask an open-ended question and put the ball in the other person's court. There, you have it. Tennis and open-ended questions. Next episode, we'll explore the nexus between croquet and closing, about which I haven't a clue. As I look back to when I developed Krieger training, which is now the easier way to sell, I searched for books and publications that focused on what it means to be an effective communicator, and I really couldn't find any, and now I understand the reason. It wasn't that it hadn't been written, it's just that it hadn't been written yet. So, as I look back, all I had to do was wait, and those of you who've been with me for a while understand that is Ike logic. Well, I waited, and I found the book, and that's great for two reasons. One, I'm constantly looking for books and writers I can recommend. And, obviously, I'm looking for a mindset that's complementary to the easier way to sell, yet different enough that it's an in addition to the system rather than a new part of. And the author I'd like to spotlight is Adam Grant. He's authored a couple books, but the book, Give and Take, fits right over our selling system like a glove. Now, I invite you to read the book on your own. However, I'll be giving an overview of why I was so excited as I progress through his work. The best way to be successful with the easier way to sell is to be a problem solver, and you must eat, drink, and dream of providing solutions or answers to the problems of others. And because who you're being as a communicator at work is probably different than who you're being when you're out with the gang. At work, you're focused on solving the problems of others. And when you come home, you want someone to solve your problems. And that's perfectly understandable. And remember, we're talking about communication styles based on your authentic self. Are you there to be of service to others, or are you there to make a deal with someone to do something for them if they do something for you? Or do you live your life as a zero-sum game where you prevail or you lose? With a taker personality, your concern for the other is outweighed by your dedication to winning. In Dr. Grant's book, he identifies these three character types as takers, matchers, and givers. And let's go over Adam Grant's definitions of each and see who you're reminded of. Let's start with a taker. Takers like to get more than they give. 
they tilt reciprocity in their own favor, putting their own interests ahead of others' needs. Takers believe that the world is a competitive dog-eat-dog place. Takers feel that to succeed, they need to be better than others. To prove their competence, they are given to self-promotion. Takers make sure they get plenty of credit for their efforts. Garden variety takers aren't cruel or cutthroat. They're just cautious and self-protective. If I don't look out for myself first, think takers, then no one will. Givers are a relatively rare breed. They tilt reciprocity in the other direction, preferring to give more than they get. Whereas takers tend to be self-focused, evaluating what other people can do for them or can offer them, givers focus on paying more attention to what other people need from them. These preferences aren't about money. Givers and takers aren't distinguished by how much they donate to charity or the compensation that they command. Rather, givers and takers differ in their attitudes and actions towards other people. If you're a taker, you help others strategically when the benefits to you outweigh the personal costs. If you're a giver, you might use a different cost-benefit analysis. Alternatively, you might not think about the personal cost at all, helping others without expecting anything in return. If you're a giver at work, you simply strive to be generous in sharing your time, your energy, common knowledge, skills, ideas, and connections with other people who can benefit from them. Very few of us act purely like givers or takers, adopting a third, third, third style, and that one in the middle is we become matchers, striving to preserve an equal balance of giving and getting. Matchers operate on the principle of fairness, and when matchers help others, they protect themselves by seeking reciprocity. If you're a matcher, You believe in tit-for-tat and your relationships are governed by even exchanges of favors. Across occupations, it appears that givers are just too caring, too trusting, and too willing to sacrifice their own interest for the benefit of others. There's even evidence that compared with takers on average, givers earn 14% less money. They have twice the risk of becoming victims of crime and are judged 22% less powerful and dominant. So, if givers are most likely to land at the bottom of the success ladder, who's at the top, takers or matchers? Neither. When I took another look at the data, I discovered a surprising pattern. It's the givers again, and this pattern holds up across the board. So I want to explore what separates the champs from the chumps. And I found that successful givers recognize there's a big difference between taking and receiving. Taking is using other people solely for one's gain. Receiving is accepting help from others while maintaining a willingness to pay it back and forward. We all have goals for our own individual achievements, and it turns out that the givers who excel are willing to ask for help when they need it. Successful givers are every bit as ambitious as takers and matchers. They simply have a different way of pursuing their goals. When takers win, there's usually someone who loses. Givers succeed in a way that creates a ripple effect, enhancing the success of people around them. However, many givers tend to act like matchers because they perceive giving to be risky. We can't forget about those people at the bottom of the ladder because some givers become pushovers and doormats. And in this book, Adam Grant tells you how to avoid becoming a pushover or a doormat, a great segment of this book. Matchers are prevalent by three to one, but the fear of exploitation by takers is so pervasive that it encourages the worse in others. Success doesn't have to come at someone else's expense. Givers are not giving for a quid pro quo, but are looking to make a difference. I'll finish this with a quote from Gandhi that was in the book. Let us become the change we seek in the world. Well, you can see why I got excited when I came across this book. I invite you to run out to your favorite bookstore and get a copy or go to your favorite book provider online and 
click on Adam Grant's Give and Take. It's not only a great book, but combined with the system, it will really help you in your quest to find the easier way to sell. It's been interesting looking back on this communications model that I started developing 30 plus years ago and seeing how the passing of time has or has not altered my feelings about the system and its effectiveness. I started to develop the early version of Krieger training when I was half my current age. And one of the few things that's really changed since the mid 1980s has been my relationship to the actual communication between a prospect and myself. In the late 1980s, I attended a three day personal transformation seminar that helped me recognize a new and different value for effective communication. A lot changed. My communication with friends and family changed, and I found that as I got older, I became even more committed to authentic communication and the accompanying rigors, like developing a willingness to listen, and the always surprising rewards when participating in a real, actual, authentic conversation. But here's one of the changes to the system that's crossed my mind over the last year or so, and I thought I would share it with you because I think it's worth giving a thought as to easing your concern about ditching your pitch and getting rid of your demonstration, etc. at the beginning of your sales call. Uh, by now, you've probably had a chance to go over what the system calls the prelude. And the prelude sets the stage for the rules and the agenda we want all parties to follow as we progress through the sales conversation. And the prelude goes something like this. Uh, hello, Mr. or Ms. Prospect. I don't know if you need what I have because I really don't have enough information yet. But if it's OK with you, I've got a couple questions to ask and you might have a couple to ask of me. And based on my experience within a few minutes, we'll know whether or not there's a reason to move forward. Is that OK? Now, as you know from going through the action guide and hearing me talk about authenticity, I'm a fan and I can always relate to my experience as an actor because an actor's job description is you go to work and you be authentic. I've also discovered that authenticity can be displayed in another way. Part of that authenticity stems from you suggesting putting off your presentation or your demonstration in favor of this conversation. It's on this issue that I believe a small yet dramatic shift might be in order. And here are my thoughts. Make your prospect aware that your goal is to give them a presentation or a demonstration or that your sales manager likes you to give a demonstration or a presentation as soon as you get in the door. In this scenario, you can come in with a briefcase and you can come in with your demo kit, but you put them somewhere over to the side. Now, the advantage of putting your demo kit or your presentation somewhere over to the side is that you can use all of this to your communications advantage by telling them this. My manager, my partner, my boss, whoever it is, you fill in the blank, likes it when I come in and find an opening to give my presentation right away. Now you point to your stuff and you say, but I don't know yet whether or not you even have a need for what I offer. So before I bring out any material, I'd like to have a conversation and maybe ask you a couple of questions and you can ask me a couple of questions and then you're right back into the prelude. This approach gives you an opportunity to establish a rapport-filled communication based on the fact that neither one of you wants to spend the time going over all of the details of your product or your service and finding out that it doesn't meet your needs later on. So let's have a conversation first and see whether there's a fit. 
It's in this step that you finally understand why the system works as well as it does, because everybody gets to take a momentary breather, because the full frontal sales approach, if you'll excuse the expression, has been postponed. R&R is part of the YES formula. It stands for Rapport and Relationship. R&R is one of the five ingredients that make up the YES formula. And when you recognize the reluctance that people have to being sold to or being given another demonstration, and you can use Rapport and Relationship to help establish that you empathize with their predicament, they'll start to lower their defenses. Remember, this system is designed to work every time, and it doesn't. However, you'll have a more authentic conversation more of the time, and this authentic conversation will lead to a closed sale more of the time. As I used to say in my slogan for Krieger training, turn your contacts into contracts more easily and more often. That's what this is all about, the easier way to sell. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Jam-packed, at least I think it was jam-packed. You know, obviously your opinion is the one that counts. Uh, I know we're all in sales and we're all selling all of the time, but all of us probably sell something that's pretty different from each other. And in our next episode, I have a conversation with somebody who will really give light to the fact that sales is more than just about communicating with someone else. It's actually being able to deliver, know your margins, know how to get the product to your clients. It's about the supply chain and how you fit into it. So make sure that you tune in to our next episode and hear my friend Dan Deegan. This is Ike Krieger. See you next time.